وايضا معنا كلمه مسجله للاستاذ مسعود احمد رئيس مركز التنميه العالميه والمدير السابق لاداره الشرق الاوسط واسيا الوسطى لصندوق النقد الدولي عن السياسات الماليه العالميه وانعكاساتها على الدول الناشئه. Dear Minister Mait, dear colleagues, thank you for giving me this opportunity to contribute to the discussions that you're having today. I'd like to make uh, three points in my intervention. First, let me start with uh, a stock take of uh, where the world economy is after the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank, which uh, ended a few days ago, and at which, uh, Dr. Mait, you were a very active participant. And uh, I want to start with that because uh, that is a context in which any uh, current pressures uh, on the Egyptian economy will have to be dealt with. And uh, the main takeaway that I have uh, from uh, the discussions that took place here in Washington is that uh, the world economy is going to be facing some uh, very steep challenges uh, in the year ahead because of the lingering impact of uh, three forces uh, in particular. First, uh, the consequences of the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, what that has meant for food prices, for energy prices, for fertilizer prices. Uh, second, uh, there is a cost of living uh, uh, crisis that is happening across the world, and, and you see it in Egypt, but uh, it's in the advanced economies, it's in emerging markets. Uh, inflation is proving to be more broad-based, uh, more stubborn, and uh, will last uh, longer. Third, uh, we've just seen the uh, uh, conclusion of the uh, Congress in, in China, but the slowdown of the Chinese economy. Uh, so the large motor for the world will also have an impact on uh, the global economic outlook for the next year. And all this, of course, comes on top of the COVID uh, crisis uh, and pandemic, which uh, continues uh, to affect many countries. So there are all these pressures, and the net result of these pressures is that the global economic uh, uh, growth forecasts have been brought down yet again, uh, by the IMF, by the World Bank. The IMF is now projecting a growth rate of 2.7% for next year. Um, but there is a one in four chance, it says, that the growth rate could be less than 2%. Consensus forecasts are already uh, down to uh, 2%, near 2%. Uh, more than a third of the global economy will be going through a contraction either this year or next year. And in this context, tackling inflation is the number one priority that is seen by the policymakers of the rich country. So inflation will be high, but so also will be the strength of the measures on monetary policy to tackle inflation, which means interest rates are going to be higher uh, for longer. So we need to be prepared for that. So in short, the worst is yet to come. 2023, for many parts of the world, will feel like we are in a recession. That's my first point. Second point I want to make is that in this context, emerging markets will be facing some specific difficulties. So you are feeling a set of pressures in Egypt, but it's... Uh, Many countries, many emerging markets are going through the same kinds of pressures. Uh, it's not a big comfort for you because it's still as difficult uh, for you to have to deal with them. But uh, be aware that this is a broad based uh, uh, problem. Financial markets are going to be uh, more reluctant. International financial markets will be harder to access. Uh, there is no longer going to be the search for yield that has a uh, uh, been there for a while, uh, and you will see also that uh, pressures on debt are going to be uh, felt in many countries, and I'll come to debt in a minute. Uh, the dollar, uh, the U.S. dollar, uh, is uh, now at its highest value in 20 years, so every emerging market currency is under pressure pretty much. 
advanced economy currencies also if you have been to the uk recently or you have been to to the uh, european uh, to the euro area you will see the consequences of a high dollar uh, there and and what that means is that this is a force that uh, we cannot in any country uh, try to uh, block uh, the uh, this is just a global phenomenon for the moment uh, caused by a search for safety uh, caused by the relative strength of the U.S. economy and caused by the high interest rates there. And, and that's just going to be an across-the-board pressure we'll feel. Now, the third point, therefore, that I want to leave you with is that the shocks may be global, but the response will have to be primarily national economic policies. So how well Egypt emerges from this difficult period ahead is going to be determined largely by what Egypt itself pursues in terms of its economic policies. And some of these are our immediate policies of, of how we manage uh, the exchange rate and, and the pressures on the exchange rate. Uh, but some of it are also uh, dealing with some of the underlying fundamentals. And uh, I have not been following uh, the Egyptian economy so closely over the last uh, few years. But when I look at uh, some of the numbers, I'm struck still by three or four things which I share with you. The first is that actually Egypt has had a very impressive uh, growth uh, track record for the last few years compared to many countries. Um, unemployment has been brought down. Poverty numbers are improving. All that is good. But a lot of this growth has been uh, driven by an increase in private consumption. And what struck me when I looked at the numbers is that the private investment numbers and the export numbers are really not doing well. Uh, they are quite low in relation to many other emerging markets. And so I do feel that this may be the moment where there is a shift from the focus on private consumption to uh, more of an emphasis on investments and export, the private investment and exports. Now, the other side of this and is I wonder how much of this uh, low private investment is linked to the very large role that state-owned enterprises continue to play in the Egyptian economy. Uh, are they crowding out some of that private investment? And um, I read up some of the numbers in the recent uh, reports. I was struck by what a large share of production, I think it's 16%, is, is state-owned enterprises. Um, I was struck also by the fact that one-third of these enterprises are making losses. And... Uh, uh, they may, they, from what I read, and uh, again, uh, I may not have exactly the right numbers, but the losses that are being made are being made in sectors where there's no reason to be making losses. And uh, I also read a World Bank report that said that the uh, productivity in the private companies was four times higher than the productivity of these uh, state-owned enterprises. So I think if we're going to shift towards exports and towards private investment, and I really do believe that without that, it'll be hard to build resilience in the Egyptian economy, then you probably have to look also at the role of state-owned enterprises. Um, the other thing that struck me is the debt numbers. Now, the debt numbers in Egypt are getting to levels that I would begin to worry about in the 90 or so percent of GDP. Large part of that is domestic uh, debt, so you're not quite as exposed. But the international debt is now trading at uh, over 1,000 basis points. That's in a group of countries that really you don't want to be uh, seen as, as being part of. Uh, also, the debt service is quite high. Uh, so almost a third of the budget. And that really tells me that the debt that you have is quite expensive. And the last thing I would say is uh, capital flows. You know, there is a history of this in Egypt, of international capital flows coming in uh, during good times, um, but coming in in a form of 
portfolio flows that are quite volatile. We saw it in 2018, saw it in 2020. I think you saw it again in the second quarter of this year when there was a large reversal of uh, those private capital flows. As soon as things get difficult, that money leaves. And, and uh, uh, it looks good when it's coming in. Um, I don't think it is uh, the same as getting foreign direct investment, which is more longer term, more engaged in the, uh, in the long game, if you like, in support of the economy. So I do wonder whether that's also something to look at. Uh, these are not problems that are issues that I've raised that, that you don't know much better than I do. Uh, you have all followed these questions much more closely. Um, so I want to just uh, leave you really with the thought that uh, uh, unlike previous episodes, uh, when there was pressure on the economy that had to be dealt with, uh, this time around, the international context in which Egypt has to deal with these pressures uh, is not going to be as uh, uh, expansive or as uh, supportive as uh, it has been in the past. And so uh, the burden of uh, making the right policy choices at the right time is going to fall on, on your uh, shoulders. Um, and as we have seen recently, including in the country like the UK, um, the scope for policy error is much, much uh, more constrained now than it uh, might have been in, in more forgiving times. So I'm sorry to leave you with a um, somewhat downbeat message, but I wanted to share this context with you. And I wish you uh, a very good conversation today and uh, look forward to hearing from you, Minister Maid, on uh, the uh, outcome of your deliberations. Thank you so much. إذا قرار اتخاذ المسار الصحيح للاقتصاد المصري هو الهدف الذي يتحمله كل من هو في القاعة الآن